Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Ben Belkin, the man behind Jack Wolf Knives. By now, you all know Jack Wolf Knives, and if you watch a lot of knife live shows, you might know Ben too. Now, just a year and a half after starting the company, Jack Wolf has 14 modernized slip joints and one bolster lock folder to its name. Ben and the brand have breathed a new life into an already humming slip joint market and has won over collectors not normally drawn to non-locking knives. And to me, that's quite an accomplishment. We'll talk about the new locking knife and the latest version of the laid back Jack right here. Uh, But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe share the show and hit the notification bell. And uh, if you want to listen on the go, download it to your favorite podcast app. And as always, if you'd like to help support the show, you can do so by going over to the knife junkie.com slash Patreon, or you can scan that QR code. That's the knife junkie.com slash Patreon. Ben, good to have you back, sir. Good to be back, Bob. I like your uh, that Google search thing oh. <laughs> you got there. That's cool. Yeah, that's uh, that's the work of Jim, Jim the the magic magic man behind the switcher. I like that too. I also like the tapestry you're in front of. You look like uh, a medieval kind <laughs> of lord. Yeah, I don't know much about it. When I bought this house, um, I bought it furnished because I didn't have anywhere near the furniture for this place and the guy i bought it from was downsizing and so the tapestry came with the house (laughs) i like it it's very regal yeah i I dig it yeah well uh, i want to congratulate you on the success of the new laid back jack i have been so thrilled with this i'm going to put this up here because i don't have the knife cam and just uh how how excited and happy and thank you in person for the wood version of this. Uh, I think you read the room properly or correctly, and you knew that not only do would I be really, really interested in the wood version, but also my audience. Um, tell us about this new laid back Jack release. Well, that's exactly right. And I'll just throw up this uh, Kieranite with DLC. So this release represented a lot of firsts it was our first re-release it was our first time implementing some new materials and more than one certainly and it was our first introduction of a new artist so kind of a milestone release for uh for us and you know looking back on it it's it's pretty cool well, it seemed uh, to be, and here's a word I hate, but it's perfect for this, uh, seemed to be kind of a seamless thing. Yeah, you have a lot of firsts here, but they all seem natural and they all feel right. Uh, just having spoken with you uh, over the past year and a half about this, um, your ideas about slip joint knives, having the manufactured, brought over here, natural materials, uh, even Kieranite. I remember we talked about Kieranite too, and some concerns about Uh, that and how it would deal with different humidities and travel and all that. Uh, You seem to overcome those challenges with this release. What were some of those challenges? Yeah, I don't like to take the approach of I'll never do something or blindly let's do it. So things have to be tested and not rushed. So and in as much of that effort was undertaken, as you said, we ran into some challenges. Now, the one that was unforeseen to me was what's the best way to finish the material? And you just take for granted that an OEM would just know given a certain material, but that's not the case, at least in my situation. And so initial batches that came back to me were puzzlingly bad in some (laughs) circumstances. You know, like why would someone send this, you know, like this is not good. This is 
you know, this is not acceptable, like not even close. So, and that's okay because as long as you're not committing yourself to large orders before you hash it out, you take the time to hash it out. And in some cases that was just, Hey, let's try polishing it. In some cases it was, you know, we need to involve the manufacturer of the materials and get not only their recommendations for finishing, but also the machining process. So how it, what steps are taken on the machine, the CNC machine to transition from off the machine to whatever final process is being undertaken. So the, the biggest challenge was just uh, dialing them in and how long it took. I've been working on these materials since blade show 2022. Hmm. You mean in terms of perfecting them and having uh, perfecting the finishes and learning how best to, uh, well, work. I would say it, it was at Blade Show 2022. I started buying some of this material. Oh, so okay. like I picked okay. up a few sheets at Blade Show, you know, and shortly thereafter, I sent it over and said, OK, you know, make me this knife, this knife and this knife and try, you know, I, I didn't specify finishes. That was the learning lesson. So if anybody here is listening, just don't assume that the finish you want is the finish you're going to get. The best thing you can do is shoot some videos, you know. I mean, videos are always better than pictures. You might have to beg, borrow, and steal to get a couple knives that look the way you want them. Mm -hmm. um, so I did lose some time with just the assumption that they were going to come back okay. The other thing, too, now that I'm sitting here thinking about it, is the fitment. So not all the materials I sent over there allowed for the corners of the scale material to be tightly fit where it meets the titanium. Sometimes you would get some corner lifting or sometimes they experience chipping and breaking. So it's just not easy to, to do things that are unlike you were doing before. Was the Kiranite, it seems to me when you were talking about um, uh, things came back puzzlingly bad, like why would this, why would they do this? The first thing I thought of was the Kiranite. That's not something I think of necessarily on um, too many knives, except for older slip joints, uh, American made slip joints. And so I thought maybe unfamiliarity with the material, uh, but no, they make plenty of uh, wood knives and also titanium knives. Yeah, I think some of it was just a reluctance to essentially they're having to polish these by hand. So there was probably a reluctance to do that because of the time consumption. So they probably... I don't know if cutting corners is the right word, but they probably tried to use methods that required less time in the hope that I would find them acceptable. And that was just not the case. They sent me some that were, from what I could tell, bead blasted, looked terrible. It's like, no, 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 that's not, it's not what we want out of this. And, you know, the lesson from, I'm always learning. The lesson from me was like, be very, very clear about your expectations, you know? Mm. Very, very specific about how you want the end product to look, um, I would imagine, because this is also the first time you're using kiranite. It's the first time you're using wood. It's the first time you're using full titanium handles, one of which is jigged, I guess you would call that. Is that jigging? And then, yep. and then lastly, uh, it's the first time you're doing this hand rub satin. Right. And, and it's also the first time you're doing DLC. There, like you said, lots of firsts. Yeah. So, um, I mean, was it was it those scale materials that were the biggest uh, hitch? It was a little bit of everything. Like first, they started with PVD, and PVD looks good, but they were like, "We'll have better durability with DLC." And I'm not going to sit here and I'm I'm not a technical expert on the difference between these things. I know DLC is more costly and is supposed to be a higher quality. So if you're in the audience, just take that with a grain of salt because it's not my expertise, these coatings, but mm -hmm. there was, I, I could, I just said like, if you, if you want to switch to DLC, that's fine. But now you got to send me a DLC. I, it's not good enough for you to just tell me they're both black. Cause I know they're not going to look exactly the same, you know? And so the, I think the PVD is actually more true black and the DLC is like a little bit more maybe in the gray um, 
but you know, I just wanted to make sure there's a balance between performance and aesthetics that we're always mm -hmm. striving to strike. So I felt the DLC got that done. Um, go ahead. It, it, I'm not sure if it's uh, true or not, but my feeling about it is that the DLC is a smoother finish than Sarah, uh, than, um, PVD PVD. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know if that's true or not, but, uh, uh they're, they're both, I think they both employ like PVD as uh, particle vapor deposition. So there's like a process where the coating is essentially a gas and then the particles are deposited in a vacuum under pressure or heat or something. And again, like I said, I probably sound, someone's probably shouting at me right now telling me, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'll be the first to admit it's not my expertise is coatings, but I wanted to make sure the coating was durable, look good, evenly applied all that. So we basically went back to the drawing board when they sent, when they upgraded the coating to DLC, it's like, now I got to do all these cut tests. You know, now I got to see what happens if I cut paper, if I cut food, if I cut through cardboard, if I whittle on some wood, you know, I just wanted to make sure it was going to work. Now, in regards to the titanium, I'd say this, the thing that went the smoothest was the smooth titanium because it's essentially just an extension of the bolster. Mm -hmm. And so the familiarity was there. But with the jigging, we ended up like having to refine that. And it was things I didn't contemplate, like the edge condition around the jigging. It's like, OK, if you're you can't create an uncomfortable edge, you know, and can so you, you don't. Pull, can you pull one of those out? And I, and I, I knew you're going to ask. I, uh, I only have the rosewood and the purple here today, uh, <laughs> unfortunately. <shucks. Okay. laughs> um, but you know, it's, maybe it's, it's online up in a picture. P people yeah. can look it up. But uh, yep. And so, you know, just some refinement there. And anytime you want to experience a change in the design or prototype process, there's a significant time cycle, right. you know? So what I was hoping was that, you know, before Blade Show, I would have been able to reveal some of these things, but it just wasn't in the cards. And it didn't really bother me because I kind of had two parallel new uh, yeah. initiatives going on. I had the gunslinger and then I had the Feel revisions good. to the, oh. yeah, I had the revisions to the slip joints that I was working on. I knew one would come out in the wash before the other. Yeah. Yeah. And at that, at that point, the feel good was still feeling fresh and the gunslinger was, Oh my God, brand new. So, right. Uh, yeah. Those, those were uh, opportune to be there with, uh, if you couldn't be there with the ones that you were, aiming for uh let's talk about this rosewood for a second now uh something i i keep mentioning when i talk about this is how i love the material because it's used in guitar fretboards mine is a beautiful beautiful example of the wood perfect coloration and everything um but it's used in guitars it's a durable wood but also beautiful and i would imagine somewhat easy to work with if it's something that's going to be mass produced or you know, small batch mass produced. Uh, uh, how did you go about choosing this wood in particular? So part of it was just availability. Like they didn't have a lot to choose from in the beginning. I've been after them to source more stuff in the event this is well received. So part of it was availability. Part of it was of the ones I had available to me. I wanted something that just presented classic you know, <laughs> and this rosewood to me does that. It just looks like class. And you know, there's other things we could talk about the rosewood, but it was the availability and the presentation and kind of how it all color. Yeah. Fits together with the various finishes and colors on the knife. It just looked good. You know, uh, that's exactly uh, those three colors right here are. They go so nicely together. Yeah, especially the, that horizontal uh, finish on hand, the the blade. hand satin. Yeah, yeah. So okay, let's talk about the blade for a second here. A noticeably larger sharpening notch on this one, and then again, like we were just mentioning, the horizontal uh, finish uh, hand rub. Is that hand rub finish? T tell us about this a little bit. Yes. Yeah, so hand rub finish cost me more to implement. But and it's a kind of thing where if you're going to do it, 
it better look good, right? Because I already have a really beautiful belt satin finish that people are accustomed to. Yeah. And you can screw up a hand rub finish, like make it look like it's poorly done. Um, and so I gave them feedback on the first few that came through to me. I leaned on some of the guys I know that make custom knives who do hand rub finishes. And it's like, okay, I showed them those. What could I do to improve this? What feedback should I give them this and that? But once I got a sample that met my expectations, I was like, man, this looks really good. And once I kind of paired it with the wood, I was like, well, if that doesn't appeal to the more traditional slip joint guy, I don't know what will. Yeah. Yeah. Those three colors that, that blasted titanium, uh, that gray is so beautiful. Uh, and then next to the, the finish and the and the wood uh but what boggles my mind is that it's actually hand finished uh there are actual people doing this oh, yeah. um, it's, how did how, <laughs> it's in there it's in a little vice and there yeah. it is wah, wah, wah. so uh, is is that something obviously it's something they do but this is not something that we think of in when we think of the modern knife building context in a factory you know super modern factory making like highly highly precise instruments like this we don't think of people hand rubbing anything i think we would be surprised to find out that these places are a mixture of old world craftsmanship and modern manufacturing because i don't think you can execute these knives with just the machines you know like when they grind these things as a unit someone with skilled hands has to do that yeah. You know, at a minimum, you've got a station where people are screwing these things together and inspecting them. And if they fancy themselves as knife makers and can make a variety of styles of knives, they're going to have to have that institutional knowledge, those tools, those skills to produce whatever the customer wants, you know, and having some sandpaper and the right fixture to hold the things and someone with enough hours in the process to do it as quickly as possible, but make it look good. I mean, I was pleased it was there. I was pleased they did a good job because yeah. I've gotten a lot of really good feedback on it. And honestly, I'm starting to get really partial to it. I was like, you know, gung ho about the belt satin, of course, because I was using a lot of it and I wasn't like, you know, jump, chomping at the bit to have something like this. But I was like, man, we should check it out, you know? And I was like, oh, gosh, that, that looks really good. It it, it looks uh, really good. I mean, I can't see any evidence of misstep or anything. And, and yeah, I've, I've looked. I've looked. It, it's so good. It's so well done. Um, but I'm not here to just gush over how much I love this knife. But I do love it. I, I, I'm ready to gush about something else. No, something I've been talking about a lot is the Gunslinger Jack. And the thing, uh, this is, a, if, if this were not a Jack Wolf knife, uh, I, would, I would think, wow, this is a really unique and cool knife. This fits into the Jack Wolf knife lineup perfectly. But the thing that boggles the mind is that uh, you turned your talents towards a totally different kind of knife designing and you knocked it out of the park on your first outing. Uh, what was it like learning how to design a different kind of knife? Well, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed all of it. It, it was, let's see here. You know, the first prototypes need a lot of work. But I wasn't discouraged because I didn't have this. You don't feel the same amount of pressure as I did when the first slip joint came out, you know, because I guess in the back of my mind, I knew if I can't make this work the way I want it to, I can crumple it up and throw it in the trash and start all over. And I don't have everything riding on it. So mm -hmm. I'd like so there was a, a sense of less pressure, which was kind of nice. Um, it takes the stress off a little bit. So it really, I guess, freed up some of that emotional energy to focus on the creative side of it. And I, a lot of this, frankly, is a result of like my intention, my design philosophy and what I wanted out of this project. And then I sort of worked within that box because when you're starting with something new, it could be 
anything. But I knew I wanted it to look like a Jack Wolf knife. I knew I wanted it to have traditional knife feel and aesthetic. And then the other thing that I was really keen on was, you know, I listen, obviously I participate in a lot of these podcasts, but I listen to 10 times as many. Mm -hmm. And I listen very carefully to what everybody's talking about pretty much every single day. And, you know, 90% of the chatter is about locking knives. That's just the way it is. So you listen to what guys are excited about. You listen to what they complain about and what their expectations are. And it's like, I'm just copiously taking notes in my mind, you know, multiple deployments, um, over travel stops, lock bar inserts, you know, no one can be happy with any given pocket clip, you know, stuff <laughs> like that. Talk about the, probably the most, uh, controversial thing ever, I think is pocket clips, but I digress. Um, so, you know, I just like really took that all in and said, this is what I want out of this. And then I had, fortunately, I had designs where I could bring them over. So I don't have to redesign the frame and I don't have to redesign the blade profile. Let's see if we can make work the, you know, what we've already done. Now, when it came to laying out the geometry and understanding the mechanism, I, I was like, okay, this is, I don't know this. I can take a bunch of knives apart and look and learn some things, which I definitely did. I pretty much took apart every locking knife I have in my collection. And you start to see all kinds of similarities when you do that. It's like, okay, I'm not reinventing the wheel. I just need to understand the wheel. Right, right. <laughs> and then um, a friend of mine, Chris Ortiz from Cerberus Knives, um, he's probably most well known for his replacement scales for spider co's. Um, but he also does like boutique, small fixed blades with, you know, boutique steels and really premium heat treatments and stuff. But we've made friends like well over a year ago and we help each other out with stuff. Like he's in, he's younger, he's mid twenties. So you know, I kind of lean on him for what's cool because you and I both too old to be really cool anymore, yeah. you know, so you got to let the younger guys tell you what's cool. Um, but he's also like super talented designer and really good at 3D rendering. Um, he designed the Arian, which is uh, right. what's it called? Uh, what's the name of the company that released that? I can't think off the top of my head. Um, so but nonetheless, so we kind of. Um, trade information. He helps me with design. I help him with kind of the business and the mentoring side, like how to think through problems, how to make a plan, how to set up your spreadsheets to keep track of the information you're gathering. And like I, I gave, I, I help him with the formula for running the business. He helps me with the formula for design. So it's like really mm, that's cool. good relationship we have, you know? So with his help and a lot of hours, we kind of hashed out the first gunslinger. And it came back and I, I knew I had to make like 10 substantive changes, but you could see it at that point. You mm. know, like if you were making something out of clay, it's like it's not perfectly chiseled yet with all the cuts just right. But it's like, oh, it's in there and we know how to get there now, you know. Um, and so I think we had at least three, maybe four prototype iterations and when the last one came back and I was just like, I can't do any better, you know, not without feedback, not saying it's perfect, but like for my first offering to the market, like I have the confidence that this is the best I can do right now without learning from it, from the right. market. Did you consciously go back to the very first design uh, to do this or did it just, uh, was it just coincidental I mean, because obviously it seems like you're going back through the through the cycle now uh, because this is like the very first one. And of course, the laid back is the second <laughs> version of your second release is is are you kind of going through the knives that way or is it sort of coincidental? Well, I, what I will say to that is if not all my slip joints are going to translate perfectly mm. to a locking knife without some kind of modification. Right. Like I didn't want to do thumb studs. I wanted to have middle finger flick versus thumb flip. And so, of course, you want to start with the first knife again. But if it did, wasn't conducive, I would have picked another design. Okay. But coincidentally, when you look at the sharpshooter, it's like, 
I don't think it could be any better yeah. because you have this area here to get your middle finger in and the long pull just looks super appropriate on this clip point blade. So, and the, and the full it, height, the, hollow, the full height hollow grind is great for, for purchase for just putting the fat of your thumb there and flicking it out. Exactly. Um, so the size you're kind of in that EDC sweet spot was, was that, uh, was the blade choice and, uh, have to do with the locking, uh, the fact that it was locking. Yeah. I, so that, that was one of the things I kind of gained listening to the community because I'm a slip joint guy. To me, a big knife has a four inch handle. Right. And, but I also own a small Sabenza and a large Sabenza. And you hear a lot of people say like small Sabenza is too small for me. Well, it has a four inch handle more or less. And I've always thought the large Sabenza, I mean, it's a beautiful knife. It's just a big knife. You know, it's, it's by no means small. And so I'm like, I think the Goldilocks zone is kind of right in between. And I think that I've got plenty of offerings with a four inch handle. Like if you want mm -hmm. kind of a gentleman sized pocket knife, I encourage you to try one of my slip joints. But if I'm going for the pocket knife guy, he's not, you know, the majority of that market. So first of all, these can't even go to the UK. So I, I really can't concern myself with what they have available to them. Not that I don't, but it's not as right. heavy as a consideration. Sure. And so it's like, man, that three and a quarter inch blade. I think it's a sweet spot. It's not too big. It's not too small. It's Goldilocks. And once I got the first prototype, I was like, and I have big hands, you know, and I'm like, if I can manipulate this knife in all these ways, I think it's spot on. So a big, um, you said a big controversial uh, part of this was that pocket clip. Uh, I think the pocket clip is very well designed. I think it's kind of, uh, it's, it's not understated. It's stated just enough. You know, there's just enough angularity on it. It's got a little fluting. You, it's, it's got hidden hardware. Um, and I love it. I, I use it. Uh, I've been carrying this all summer. This is ordinarily... Um, uh, has been shorts, uh, shorts wear. And, and as we go into uh, winter, it'll probably migrate to the back pocket. Um, and incidentally, I am getting snail trails, which is kind of exciting on this knife, but not on any of my slip joints. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, the pocket clip is excellent. People freaked some, some people freaked. Is that right? Yeah. Well, and I just think, I guess what I meant earlier is there is no one pocket clip that pleases all people. Yeah. Some guys, they want to have a wire clip and they give you the 10 reasons they think it's the best. And then some people would rather have a milled clip and they'll give you 10 reasons they think it's the best. And the same thing with a spring style clip. So it's like, what clip do I want? I, I know this clip is not going to please everybody. And I like the, some of those clips tend more towards more utility, less aesthetic, you know? Yeah. Um, but I, I like the aesthetic of a milled clip and I think the utility is sufficient. So oh. that's, and, and I think it's more premium, you know, looking. You would most, hear, definitely. you would hear, excuse my, excuse my interruption. You would hear no end of it. If you put anything but a milled titanium pocket clip on it, you would exactly. hear no end of shit. And I got to say, uh, excuse the French, uh, but I also have to say uh, I'm very happy. It's got hidden. It's got hidden hardware because not that, not that I, I just think it needs to be hidden hardware in this case. It's so sleek, so classy looking. I don't want to see a hole with a with a, with a six pointed star at the bottom of it. I just want to see both. I mean, yeah. that was all that was all me. You know, I looked at all kinds of knives and I was like, I do not want to see that screw there. Yeah. Like, I do not want to see it. This thing is bordering on jewelry. Beautiful. Yeah. And it's. <sighs> It's unnecessary. Now, I understood that that means to remove it, you're going to have to take the knife apart. But I also understand that guys love taking these knives apart, you know, and if someone's hesitant to do it, you know what? Mail it to me. I'll do it for you. No problem. Happy to help you out, you know, <clears throat> and and also that's all coupled with this concept, which I had to have like this was as much for anybody else for me because now, I you're talking just, about the filler tab the in filler case tab, the plug uh, 
yeah, in case anyone's uh, just listening, uh, when, if you remove the pocket clip on the gunslinger jack, the bolster lock uh, knife here, uh, you can fill that gap with the uh, with an anodized titanium filled tab that looks exactly the same. Yep, it matches the it's color match to the backspacer and the pocket clip. And so for me, I don't carry pocket clip knives. So I'm like, I'm not going to produce a knife that I will be loath to carry. Hmm. And I said, so I've got to have an insert. And if you think it's going to look bad with the screw showing through the pocket clip, it's going to look really bad yeah. with the screw showing through this insert. So, yeah, it's like there's all these really careful chamfers and bevels around the insert and around the well that the insert in the pocket clip goes. If you get your pocket clip under like a magnifying glass, every edge is beveled or chamfered. Um, the, the backspacer and the frame, all edges are beveled and chamfered. I was going for like a different look than the slip joints, you know, but I wanted it to have an overall look and form factor and leather slip carryability of a slip joint. So like at first glance, you, you might think it's a slip joint, get up real close to it and inspect it. It's like, Ooh, that's something different. Yeah. Uh, when you're, when you're talking about the, uh, you wanted the back to look different. I'm going to hold it up next to its granddaddy. The, uh, well, here's the gunslinger. Mm -hmm. And here's the um, sharpshooter. And of course, the sharpshooter is a slip joint. And so it's all hafted really smooth and uh, everything is totally uniform. Uh, but here, everything on the backspacer and the uh, titanium slabs on the back of the gunslinger, everything is has these micro chamfers. So everything is defined really nicely and, and crisply. Yeah, I just felt like it's got a little bit more touch of modern. You know, it's like we're kind of taking it through the ages. We went, we took a traditional slip joint and then we brought it to today. And then we took the modern slip joint and modernized it further with a more modern mechanism and more modern angular touches. Um, and, you know, I, there's a lot of little design fundamentals in there, or I should say cues that I'm glad people enjoyed because I wasn't sure what they would think. So I did a full length backspacer as long as I could take it because I wanted it to resemble the back of a slip joint. Now yes. you inspect most locking knives these days. They do not have full length backspacers. They are right. few and far between. I was kind of surprised. Um, and even when you, when you open it, how they essentially almost touch to give you that continuous, yeah. um, you know, surface. And then I had a lot of people kind of ding me for this, but it's just not what I wanted. A lot of people would say, oh, I wish it had better lock bar access. <laughs> it's like you're only saying that because you want to play with it easier. By no means does this knife <laughs> do you struggle whatsoever to, to disengage the lock bar. Yeah. It's like you don't come at it from the side. You just come at it from the blade well. There's a nice thumb scoop. It works great. I don't, I, I've never once failed to disengage. Yeah. And it doesn't and, pinch either. Sometimes you'll get a pinch between a, uh, a, a liner lock or a bolster lock and the scale material, but I've never pinched myself on this. And even, well, yeah, Bob. And that's because in prototyping, we cut a relief right uh, there. Oh, uh, I, you know, I sort of noticed that, but I didn't know why. I was Great. getting pinched in prototyping and as a lefty, like my thumb is right over that spot where you're coming at it from the other side. So yeah. you don't get there as bad, but me, my whole thumb ho ho hovers over that area. So we designed a relief in there to create some skin space. That was very thoughtful, man. Uh, I, I had seen that. I had noticed that, but I, uh, but I didn't put two and two together that that's the reason why I don't get that, that pinch. Uh, and again, we get these uh, the the awesome ergonomics of a gunstock jack, uh, which with a single bladed knife is is truly uh, something you can access there. Uh, this is the one. This is the first one you came out with. Oh no, that's not right. That's not right. Uh, so you had already stopped with the micarta at that point, and and now with the laid back jack 
version two. What are you calling it? Laid back Jack generation two or I've thought a lot about that. I just call it the laid back Jack. You okay. Know? Yeah. Because it's just another, our, you know, God willing, we have versions seven and 12 and 15. And it's like, eventually it's going to become like UFC 175 you or, know? or yeah, right, 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 right. Or it'll be like, um, uh, if you don't mind the, the parallel, uh, great Eastern cutlery number 15, you know, it's right. just like, yeah, if we're coming back with this again. Um, you know, a couple of years after the last time we made it, cause we want to do another iteration of this night. Yeah. I see what you mean. It yeah, is I just the want laid it to back be the jack. laid back jack. Yeah. You have a laid back jack in my cart. You have a laid back jack in Rosewood. Yeah. If you, people want to nerd out on it and call it whatever they want, Generation Two, Version Two, I, I don't care. But Gen officially, two. we're just calling it the laid back jack. I'm not publishing it as a sequential. Gotcha. I'm I'm gonna nerd out. I'll call it something. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but right here, uh, uh, so I'm coming back to the new laid back. Uh, before I, I ask you a couple other questions here, uh, this has a bolster, uh, that is like a Barlow. This is something we didn't talk about before. That was a huge design change, uh, from the one before, from the earlier, uh, from the first laid back Jack here. Look, it's a, it's about twice the size. Um, yep. and, uh, a traditional Barlow has a bolster that's about the, a third of the size of the handle or so. And, uh, so to, Tell us why you went to that bolster. I'm sure part of part of it is this aesthetic, but there's a, a whole other reason. Well, yeah. So, you know, I try to do what I say I'm going to do. And from the very beginning, I've said my intention is to tweak the design. If it makes sense with subsequent releases and <clears throat> almost all of the initial releases had typical size barlows with a single flute and when i put that triple flute on the midnight jack everybody loved it including me you know so one de design change i've rolled in is the implementation of triple flutes and i might just let that stick around for you know until otherwise i desire to change it because it's becoming a signature oh. now yeah. Now, as far as enlarging the bolster, well, you do have to enlarge the bolster to some degree to get the triple flute. Mm, but, mm -hmm. but, and, and this design in its initial iteration did not have a bottom bolster. So when I started playing with the CAD and I started laying out how I want the new bolster to be, I was like, kind of just hit me upside the head. Like, why has there never been, at least I know of, a swayback Barlow? It's like perfect to have a Barlow size bolster on a sway back. It like the shoe just fits. So when I catted it out, I was like, oh yeah. Cause it, initially I had kind of thought like, oh, maybe I just extend it a little bit, add the triple flutes, but the balance just didn't look right to me, you know? <clears throat> and I was like, well, we got to do, we got to pioneer the sway back bolster right here. So in your, um, well, I think it's a good thing you did. <laughs> uh, in your testing of this, you mentioned how you get up, prototypes and you test them you run them through cutting cardboard paper doing whittling and that kind of thing um did you notice a difference in side to side stability with the blade with the larger bolster no honestly i i don't know to what degree like to answer that question i think you'd have to be pretty abusive with this thing to mm. find out if one would be one would take more force before it broke. You know, I know back in the day they used those bolsters to bolster mm -hmm. the joint, but with three millimeter stock and the tight tolerances on these things, like I don't think you're going to break the joint before you actually snap the blade gotcha. or bend the tip. You know what I mean? With how finely ground these things are. So does it provide strength in the joint? Maybe, but I think more than anything, it's just an aesthetic that people really, really appreciate. Okay, so let me ask you with this release. Ah, God, that Kiranite is beautiful. That purple and black is really beautiful. And they all are. And this one, this is the first release where you have one carbon fiber. So you have two titaniums, a wood, a... Uh, uh, Kiranite and a carbon fiber. Um, mm -hmm. 
uh, what of these so far has been the most popular handle material? So this knife essentially sold out immediately. The purple oh, with the black. Nice. It just worked for people. And I, you know, as I was taking people's temperature, making knives black, black blades especially, was very hit or miss with people. You know, oh, people don't like black blades. They scuff up and then they, they don't, they won't buy them. They always sell last. Like I heard that more than once. But when I prototyped this and I got this configuration and prototyping, I looked at this and I was like, holy crap, you know, like this looks really, really good. And I don't care what anybody says, like that looks really good. And then you listen to, I don't want to say naysayers, but then you hear like, commentary that would suggest otherwise and then you start second guessing yourself you know like oh mm -hmm. is that it's yeah, plastic yeah. people are going to say it's plastic they don't want a black knife they're not going to get it they're going to think it's cheap meanwhile cure night is not cheap <laughs> i'll tell you <laughs> right now it is expensive it's as expensive as the carbon fiber so anyway i just rolled the dice on it because i i knew inside that i was impressed and it translated man and then, you know, second place, the Rosewood came out mm. strong. Um, oh, I was going to say, uh, uh, well, a, a couple of things. Um, uh, I'll remember, I'll put a, a bookmark in the first and the second one, but the, um, uh, with the Kiranite, it's a balance of mm. materials. You know, if you had the black blade, the black bolster and pure ply G10 or some sort of, or even, green my carter or something suddenly it'd be like mm, this is a little militaristic looking and guys like me would love it but a whole a whole group would not but something about that kiranite which is a classic uh slip joint material and um so swirly and beautiful and then and purple people like purple uh, especially on knives next to that black it's um it's it's really nice to look at, but it's a little bit of cognitive dissonance too. It's like you got the black and the purple. It's not a black knife in the tactical sense. It's a black knife in the tuxedo sense. Exactly. That's exactly right. And I think another, so something I've been learning <clears throat> and that I'm really starting to focus my attention on is all these finishes, materials, textures, everything. Think about them as like ingredients, like they all taste good on their own. You know, there might be some ingredients you don't like, you don't even consider them. But the ones you're working with, you're like, man, I really like every one of these. That does not mean you put these ingredients together to make a dish and people are going to like the dish. Right. They might all like these ingredients. So what's really hard to do is pick the ingredients, pair them together and pick ones that people want, mm -hmm. like are wanting to spend their money on. Yeah. You know, it's really hard. Yeah. Wow. That's a great way of putting it. That's a great analogy. Uh, you know, this is your plate of pasta. And I could buy, I love um, off the top. I love Nutella and I love grapes and I love seltzer water and I love pretzels. And we're going to put that all in the pasta. Like, no, thank you. Right. Um, that's a great way of putting it. I, I never it's thought of it that way. I didn't I, I used to not think about it that way either. I thought of things very compartmentalized, like, oh, if we're going to have if this if we've got one that's blue and we've got one that's red, then maybe we should have one that's green. And it's like it's not it. Just think about each offering and put as much thought into each individual offering you can and make it the best dish you possibly can. And you don't know. So you have to test that. But it's worth spending the time to really think about. And it's not just thinking about it. Truthfully, what you want to do is see it. You know, you want to have, I, man, I tell you what, if there's one thing that would help me more than anything is if I had, a, if I was a knife maker and I had a shop and I could make these things before yeah. I ordered a certain percentage of them. Like, hey, we want to try this new material. Let's buy a sheet. Let's cut a scale out. Okay, we've got some black blades in the drawer. Let's pull those out. Let's slap one together. I, I don't really have that. Is, and is boy, that, it would be nice. Is that something um, you could accomplish in the future? Just uh, from from your OEM, say, oh, give me, uh, uh, you know, give me half a dozen of these, or you know, give me eighteen of these blades and some of these handles, and and you just have them on 
on hand and just kind of put knives together at, at will? Is that something you could do? Well, yeah, I, I suppose you could. You, you'd have to kind of think through what that looks like. I'm to the point now where it's not quite as important because I've had so many releases and I have a lot of prototypes. Yeah. So I kind of amassed that collection over the past couple of years. But if I was starting over and if anybody's listening to this, trying to take a similar journey, like take advantage of the fact that when you're ordering prototypes, maybe you want them to make you some extra sets of scales. Maybe you want mm -hmm. them to make you some extra blades with different finishes and don't just like, pick whatever because you just want to make sure it functions right like don't miss the opportunity to specify combinations that you may want to sell you know because you might be looking at that prototype just to make sure it's the right size and the edges feel good and the action is right but don't mm, miss the opportunity yeah. to put the right clothes on it to make sure it dresses up right you know yeah that's a great way of putting it too. Yeah, that that seems like a valuable bit of uh, of advice, and and uh, anyone having a knife OEM'd could could do that. It seems like something that can easily be done, and you could cut down on your time. You know, I was thinking this would look cool with jade micarta, but since it's sort of a polarizing material and it doesn't quite look right to me, I'll skip it this time. And yeah. then you could save yourself uh, tens, if not hundreds, of dollars. Yeah, absolutely. And and it might cost more up front to get those extra parts and pieces made, but the time you will save, because you might say to yourself, like you just said, oh, I was going to use JG10 with a hand rub. Oh, that's going to look great. And then you get it and you're like, I immediately knew deep down that wasn't great. You know, I can't lie to myself. I know. Well, once it have been smart to maybe have them, well, okay, make me one in natural micarta and make me one in cross cut carbon fiber and make me one in this, like make me some extra scales. Let me swap parts yeah. when this thing comes in and see with my own two eyes, because just like trying to shop for knives online, we do it all the time. First thing you find out when you go to a knife show is how different the thing is in person than you thought it was when you looked at it. The yeah. same thing happens with your uh, material specs and finishes. Um. Okay, well, I, I want to talk a little bit about this here, the uh, uh, the little bro, which I got to experience, but many did not because of a, a uh, manufacturing you know issue when it came out, and and uh, so I was wondering, is this a knife you're planning on re-releasing, circling back to at some point? Oh, 100 percent. We've had the little bro has had some growing pains, <laughs> our little bro. So he was supposed to come out in. Well, I, so it was Blade Show 2022. I distributed some to the content creators like yourself. That's how you got one. I sold a fistful of them at the Blade Show and then I distributed them to the dealers. And then because I mean, fortunately, before those got sold to the public, the units that I had given to the content creators and the 20 to 30 people who bought them from me at the Blade Show, I started getting the reports of the Blade Wrap. And I never saw it in quality control because I would inspect the knife, close it, sometimes open it and close it again, but then I put them aside. And so I never saw, saw the Blade Wrap. So I just dodged a huge bullet. It was a huge you know, it was a, mm -hmm. what's the word I'm looking for? It was, it was a bump in the road because mm -hmm. I had to recall all of them and reschedule that production, which we did. We rescheduled it. They were supposed to be in July, um, just a couple months ago. And when those knives were in production, the manufacturer ran the wrong CNC computer program and cut the blanks for all the scales too narrow. They ran the CNC computer program for blanking scales for the feel good Jack, which if you know, mm. is real is narrower than a little bro up at the bolster. And so, you know, had they only cut them too big, then maybe we would have lost a week or two's oh, time. Yeah. But once you blow through an entire giant stack of carbon fiber sheets and cut them all too small, there's nothing you can do. And so we had to postpone the little bro. Now I have shared publicly because I want people to know what to expect with this one that we're releasing that one in November. 
Mm-hmm. So it is coming back in November. I I love this knife. Uh, it is a um, a great size. Mine did have a little bit of blade wrap. I was able to sharpen it out, and um, you know wasn't a wasn't a huge deal on my end. But I remember thinking like when this came out that this was going to be this is I, I will say when you do come out with this, this will be another interesting way to see how it's received because. I think it'll be a hit. I, I remember saying that at the time, just because of the size. Uh, some of these might be a little large for some non-slip joint people who are trying to get behind the wheel of one. Um, but this just takes it down ever so slightly. I mean, it's not that much smaller, but it does have a smaller feel. Yeah, and a lot of our guys buying these things who are not just diehard slip joint guys, they're carrying it as a secondary. Right. So... I, honestly, it's hard to have a better secondary knife than the little bro. I mean, it's basically perfect for that role. Yeah. Boys knife. Beautiful yep. old school boys knife. Okay. So I, I wanted to, uh, to tell you this. I have my first Jack Wolf knife that I think I'm going to mod. And it's very, very not severe. I think I'm just going to dye the scales on my uh, Benny's clip. I, I, I'm going to go for burgundy because it's, It's my favorite color, you know, that sort of deep red wine color. And this one is black micarta. And I think it's just, you know, when I clean it with alcohol, it's ready. It can take it. And I don't know. I'm excited to do it. Have you had many people um, uh, modding these or customizing your Jack Wolf knives? Yeah, it, you know, it's a small, it's a minority, but there's guys who love to do it. So Steven, Patty's Potato Peelers, mm-hmm. he writ dyed his Midnight Jack red. So you can talk to him about how that came out. The good thing about this micarta is it takes dye like a boss. So, yeah. And then I've had a couple guys do EO notches on low drags. I've got one guy in my Facebook group. Is that an who, easy out notch like on this? Like a little easy hole open, where you can. Yeah, easy, or easy open, open or easy. Yeah. I guess it could be easy out. I, I, I'm not exactly sure. I think you're but, right. Yeah, there's one guy who will put all kinds of different scales on his. He won't do it for anybody else. He's not for hire, so don't send me a message asking me to connect you with him. Um, <laughs> but it's really cool. There's guys that will send them to the knife modders, and yep. they do amazing work. They do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's a good template for some of that stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so are there other slip joint patterns? I know there must be, but I can't really think of what they are without going double bladed or, or multi blade. Um, so are there any other patterns of slip joints that are kind of out there that you've always kind of wanted to touch on and, and haven't yet? Well, without being too specific, because you guys know me, I don't like to give anything away. Yeah. But there are some what's the word I'm looking for? Like undiscovered, like we got some more wells to tap. So in due time, I do would, I would like to focus my design effort on converting more of these slip joint designs to locking knife designs, because I think it would be good to diversify my catalog at this point and try to serve that market. I mean, from the business side of things, it only makes sense. It's a much larger market. Mm -hmm. So the business side of me says, you know, that's a good idea. So you need to be (laughs) working on that. And, you know, I've developed a lot of slip joints already. So it's, I'm not saying I'm not going to do any more, but the the ones I want to do, most of them are done at this point. You know, there's a few I want to tackle. But as much as I want to tackle something new, I'd be equally as interested in the revisions to these like the version two of these that that stuff has to be worked on and trying to figure out a double blade trying to figure out a bottle opener like figuring some of that stuff out because i've been really short on design and engineering time um pretty much all of this calendar year which is stressful but i recently hired my first full-time employee and i have his wife working with me too as a part-time employee so I'm like watching every day as I come closer to the surface and starting to see where I'm going to get that time back to start design and engineering again, which is nice. Yeah. Yeah. That is excellent. And I'm sure that uh, 
people are thrilled to hear that you're looking forward to de to designing more locking knives. I mean, yeah, you're right. It is a much bigger part of the market, and it, and it does make sense to, I don't know, to sort of immerse yourself in. But but this uh, group of slip joints right here in front of me are are very fertile ground to to you know go into into that realm while maintaining your aesthetics obviously i mean all of these like i was thinking of i was thinking of these two would be great candidates for locking knives the cyborg and the uh, venom mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um I, i'm yeah, sure get, everyone has their own thoughts but yeah i get i mean i hear from people a lot and <clears throat> You know, I won't say what's going to come when or what I'm going to do, but what I will say with confidence is that expect more of the locking knife like the gunslinger based off my existing slip joint designs. Like it's going to happen and it's going to have like as soon as I can make it happen, it will happen. Man, that's awesome. Uh, so any 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 sort of uh, white whale out there in terms of knife making, uh, in terms of jack wolf knives things you want to achieve uh knives you want to build that uh that you could reveal because they're so far in the future that uh <laughs> you could do so so what i'll say to that bob is i want to diversify my catalog into other areas that knife collectors like you know like styles or types so use your imagination if there's something you guys who are listening or watching want to see from me let me know you know like i want to see what the oem is capable of so i'm not afraid to throw projects at them <laughs> if they don't work out they don't work out but if they do that's pretty cool the other thing i'm interested in is price like having different uh, servicing different price segments in the market. Oh yeah. Now that's a it's way easier said than done because you have to have logical price segmentation. You're competing with different products in those price segments. You don't want your products in different price segments to conflict. You want them to be complementary. Mm. you know, so that's going to require a lot of thought. But long term, I know for a fact, because it's probably one of the requests I get the most is we love what you're doing. We just wish you had something more affordable, you know, yeah. and I get that. I mean, I, I'm sympathetic to that. So I, I can't sell you the three hundred dollar knife for two hundred dollars. It doesn't work that way. But hopefully I can come up with something, you know, that is suitable in that price point that doesn't jeopardize on our values of quality, you know. Right. Quality right. doesn't have to be expensive. You can have quality that costs less than something else of quality. But when you don't have, when, when the budget's tighter, it's harder to, like, in other words, if there's no expense spared, sure, we can make something beautiful. Mm -hmm. But like, okay, make something of high quality and beautiful that people are satisfied at 50% of the price. That's a challenge. Right, right. But if the last 10, if not five years have shown us, you know, that challenge seems to be, at least from the consumer's point of view, seems to be getting easier and easier to achieve. So, you know, as you keep growing the company that, you know, I, I bet that that will come closer into reach. You know, as you're getting closer, it will come closer to you, too. Um, if you know what I mean, uh, I, I, I would like to say that I want to see an auto wolf at some point. And, uh, uh, I think that would be pretty cool to see some, some sort of automatic Jack Wolf knives knife. Uh, I'm just putting it out there. Never thought about it until tonight, but, but you put it out there. You said, uh, what do you, what do you think? And people would be, I want a kukri. I want all this stuff, but, uh, I want an auto. I think you know, there's cool. challenges with importation from China. You can't import autos. Oh. You can import the parts and then assemble them stateside. Well, I'm not exactly set up for that, but that's a, cause think about how many there would be on the market right now. If you could do that. Yeah. With it, with and, all of the changing laws. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And it's just, it's an import restriction. So um, I'm sure guys have done it, but it's not a long-term feasible thing to 
you know, have big batches of knives that could get seized because you're importing something that's illegal. Yeah. You know, so the, the way to make an auto is make it in the States or import the parts and assemble them. So it's, it's, it's not as low hanging fruit as some other things. Let's just say. I, I see what you mean. Yeah, definitely considering how they're manufactured. This would be the one that I would go automatic. Just so you I, know. Think, I think we'd have damn near a consensus that that would be the best design for an auto. Wouldn't it? And and make it just a slight bit bigger. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, it, 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 I'm on the same page as you right there. I yeah. love this knife. Well, Ben, I, I want to say uh, I, I'm really impressed with how everything has grown. I mean, we've we've known or I have known from the first time I spoke with you that you're already an accomplished entrepreneur coming into this. So you have a lot of business knowledge you can bring to this and your openness to help other people and talk openly about this in so many different platforms is also very uh, generous. I'm sure a lot of people have have gotten ideas uh, about how to start their own efforts. Um, so I appreciate that greatly. But uh, most of all, I appreciate these beautiful things you keep designing and releasing to the world. So thanks a lot. And thanks again for coming on the show and talking about your foray into locking knives. Well, thank you, Bob. You're the first one to give me a voice. I'll never forget it. Oh, man. my It will always be my pleasure, sir. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Don't take dull for an answer. It's the Knife Junkie's favorite sign-off phrase, and now you can get that tagline on a variety of merchandise, like a t-shirt, sweatshirt, hoodie, long-sleeve tee, and more, even on coasters, tote bags, a coffee mug, water bottle, and stickers. Let everyone know that you're a Knife Junkie and that you don't take dull for an answer. Get yours at thenifejunkie.com slash dull and shop for all of your Knife Junkie's merchandise at thenifejunkie.com slash shop. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Ben Belkin of Jack Wolf Knives. Uh, that was a great conversation. I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, how these knives that we've all uh, come to know and love, these Jack Wolf Knives, will be translated into locking knives in the future. We've gotten a taste, a sweet, sweet taste, as Lou Reed would say, uh, with this uh, Gunslinger Jack, and I can't wait to see uh, what else happens in the future. All right, we will check back in with Ben another time in the future. Be sure to check in with us next Sunday for another conversation with a great knife person. And uh, also don't forget Wednesday for the midweek supplemental and then Thursday for Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. Okay, for Jim, working his mag magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.